end with a few examples. Okay, well, this is somebody else's work, and it's not quite camouflaged, but I put it in because I think it's interesting to think that when you understand the way these systems, these algorithms work, um, you can use them to your advantage. Yeah. And I don't mean game them, but you can appear in them in a way that you have more control over the way your appearance is analyzed. And this is a good example from Andre Karpathy, who analyzed about five million selfies and came up with a few interesting insights about what makes a good selfie. He took a very statistical approach to it using deep neural networks. And the, the funniest takeaway um, is if you want to have um, you know, a lot of likes on a selfie, be female. <laughs> and if there's a guy in your photo, get him out of there. <laughs> Just crop, crop around it, and you'll do at least 10 points better. <laughs> Sorry, guys. That's the way it is. Um, you know, other, other ways of looking uh, into the system to see what it is that triggers these insights or these responses from the system. This uh, is what's called a synthetic activation of a neural network, and it's showing you what, what the optimal representation of disgust would be. Um, it doesn't look you know, like one face because it's kind, of, uh, it's kind of moving around when it's generating these, but you can see that you know, generally it's very like, bright, expressed, open eyes for disgust and happy, the mouth plays a big role in that. So I think these are obvious that we know what disgust and fear and happiness looks like. Um, but it's, it's only obvious when we try to understand it, you know, person to person. It's not obvious how is, does a machine think that I'm happy right now? Um, do they think, does a machine think that I'm fearful or disgusted or angry? What is it that I would have to do to trigger that labeling? of me. Um, okay, so getting into the last part, then these are some things for you guys to think about um, moving into this week about what camouflage is or what camouflage isn't. Um, in, in a recent paper that came out kind of about more about defensive strategies and cyber warfare, camouflage, you know, it's not it's not this um, jungle pattern. Camouflage is this uh, intellectual process of thinking about what is useful information. What, you know, when I, when I leave here, what information do I leave behind? Thinking about it in a forensic way. Uh, so camouflage, in this sense, is an instance of anti-forensics, attempts to thwart intelligence gathering by forensic techniques. You can also think about camouflage as having two very basic requirements, uh, the figure and the ground. And so the figure is only the figure if a ground is there. Now I'll keep referring back to this, you know, M, the M81 woodland pattern, that it, it only works when there's a jungle in the background. So there are two parts to that camouflage. And when you see somebody wearing it in an urban area, it's missing the second half. It's missing the ground. And you can see I forgot to add the attribution to this one. <laughs> the role of camouflage is not to disguise, but to offer a medium in which to relate to others. Think of this one maybe through uh, the way that fashion can act as camouflage in that you are presenting yourself in, in different ways when you put on different clothes. You're using those clothes to, to camouflage um, or express th certain things, but in a way, you're using it to relate to other people. Um, camouflage can also be thought of as a strategic concealment and exposure within physical, social, and political context. And that's kind of an all-encompassing way of looking at it. Camouflage, as we know it today, it really began 
with the naturalists looking at um, mimicry, crypsis, and the disruptive patterns in the animal kingdom, zoologists, and camouflage really did come out of a need for uh, hiding uh, from military observation, especially overhead aerial, aerial attacks. But what, you know, what is camouflage now? It's a much different, uh, much different game. So we have networked culture, we're very digital, uh, we're exchanging a lot of information, we're appearing in places where we're not able to control the way that we're seen or the way that people are looking at our images. We have a different set of what, what is the normal way to look at someone. Is it normal to draw dots on people's faces and put boxes and extract information about their psychology and their demographic? Uh, is camouflage purple? Uh, what I mean is camouflage doesn't have to have a color. Uh, this may be a wrong way of thinking or a, a limited way of thinking about camouflage. Camouflage can be an event. It can have it can happen at a specific moment. So you can think about camouflage outside of the natural world where we have to have that color scheme associated with it. We can move, we can explore new options for that. You know, what, are, what are the right questions to ask about what camouflage is today? And to, to wrap this up then, um, camouflage, you are only unique because of the way that someone else is unique. It's kind of the Ubuntuism way of thinking about who you are, your identity. And in fact, this is exactly the way that one algorithm works called eigenfaces. Um, in eigenfaces, your representation, your face print, is only developed through its relationship to other people in the database. So you are a unique face print because of everyone else in that database. So it's only through these unique relationships to others that we establish uh, the figure and the ground. But ultimately, camouflage is a human process. We're relating to things as a human, we're establishing and we're revealing or hiding uh, information that is human. But the eye that's looking at us is not. So that's, that's it. Actually, it's not, I got one more. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that one is it. Okay, so this one is the last one. And this is to make you think about normalcy. What is normal? What is weird? Well, let's see, nobody is wearing a hat, okay? And if you look back 100 years, in New York City, the opposite would be uh, weird. If you were not wearing a hat, that would be weird. Now there's one person wearing a hat. Um, and so what is normal today is not going to be normal in 100 years. So whatever the way that you appear, the things that you're wearing right now, when we look back in 100 years, will be thought of as maybe uh, not appropriate to the situation. You know, in a hundred years, everybody, it'll be common knowledge that we're being looked at by machines. How did you, as thinkers, as designers and artists, respond to that, that new, uh, that, that urgency to reappear uh, in the context of the machine eye? So, Think for your paper assignment, maybe looking back 100 years, what would this photo look like in uh, 2118? Okay.